Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. My name is Trainer Chip Ritchie and I'm joined here, as always, by my co-host Azul GG. What's going on, Azul? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty good, Chip. Uh, I'm no longer going to be going to UIC this weekend, so I'm going to be around streaming and making content. I decided not to go because I didn't know that you know, coming back to America that you had to get like a COVID test. You know, if you tested positive, you were kind of stuck over in Germany for a little while until you could get back. And had I known that initially, I probably would have never booked my trip. Um, but after knowing that, kind of thinking about, you know, is it worth the risk? And I'm just having such a good time with getting back into stream. I never thought I would say this, but streaming PTCGO has kind of like reignited my <laughs> fire to want to make content. Yeah, uh, so I'm just great, having man. a ton of a ton of fun streaming and making content and stuff. So I don't want to get stuck over there for a prolonged period of time that I kind of have no control over. For me right now, it doesn't feel like it's worth the risk. I feel really bad about unfortunately having to take uh, taking someone's place away from them. Unfortunately, registration slots are not transferable or can't go back into the pool or anything. So um going to be one less player who can unfortunately play at the uh, the EUIC because of me. So I apologize for that. Um, but that is just kind of how it is sometimes. But besides that, I'm doing good. I'm excited to watch the stream this weekend and uh, just make some more content. How about you, Chip? I know uh, you played in the 1K, I think, this weekend. All I know is that you misplayed. But besides that, I have okay, no idea how it, how it went besides that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm doing good. Yes, I did play in a 1K this past weekend. I ended up uh, losing in the top eight. I don't know that I necessarily misplayed. But uh, what Azul was <laughs> referencing is I actually had kind of a unique situation come up in game three of my top eight game. And I wasn't sure if the play that I made ended up being the correct decision or not. You know, I ended up losing the game, but sometimes you make the right play and still end up losing a game. Um, yeah. But it's still the right play to make. So I've made a poll over on my Twitter asking people like, hey, this is the situation that came up. I showed the cards that were on the board, talked about what my opponent had, showed the cards in my hand, and left a poll open for people to vote about which of the two options that I felt like were the best options to go for in that spot. And there was a lot of really interesting responses, um, and the poll was pretty close to 50-50. I think it ended up being like 55-45 versus option a option b so if you're interested in learning more about that go check it out over on my twitter it was definitely a, a really interesting and close spot um but you know i i did end up losing the game and i'm still not 100 percent sure if i uh made the right play or not but you know <laughs> regardless i still made you know a 150 bucks so i can't complain too much about that and i also had some big personal news that i announced this past weekend my wife and i are expecting our first baby our first child uh, coming in September. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be a dad, which is kind of a still a weird concept to me, <laughs> something I'm still trying to totally grasp and understand. But my wife and I are both very excited um, for this, like, you know, next step in life, bringing a child into the world. It's all just, yeah, it's all pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, it definitely sounds scary. I'm not going to lie. Having a little tortilla chip running around the house. You know, okay. Fun, so. <laughs> hey, listen, more <laughs> chips in the world is only a good thing for sure. <laughs> Uh, and it is going to be a baby boy we we found out it is going to be a baby boy so yeah we're very excited uh for that but enough of our personal stuff going on we've got a lot to talk about in the pokemon world a lot has happened this past week we're going to be talking about the new jersey regionals registration that came and went pretty quickly we've talked about registration quite a bit on the last few episodes of the podcast we're just going to break it down Pretty quickly, we're also going to be looking at some of the new cards revealed in Japan recently, especially one that seems, I don't know about you, Azul, but I think it seems pretty dang good. And then, of course, we'll have Guess That Flavor Text, everyone's favorite segment. And then we're going to be breaking down the European International Championship meta, of course, the major tournament coming up this weekend. I'm very excited for it. I'm sure, you know, anyone who's going to be playing is very excited we just got to break it down and figure out exactly what are the top decks going to be. We're going to give our opinions. And we also posted a Q&A over on our Twitter. So we're going to be taking some questions from the Uncommon Energy Twitter and uh, answering some of those here on the cast. So you ready, Azul? You ready to hop in? Yeah, I'm ready to hop in. And make sure you go follow the Twitter. So if we ever do any more of these kind of Q&As and you have a question for us, you'll be able to you know ask the question over there. But yeah, let's get into it. Uh, New Jersey Regionals um, <clears throat> sold out pretty much instantly. 
but I think everyone kind of expected that. Right. Right. Like we talked about it. I think we're like, it's we, everyone. And the thing is that they were like, they said the cap and everyone's like, that's pretty reasonable to be hit for sure. And there's already so much fear around not being able to register. So everyone's trying to register instantly. Like no surprise. I think it was lasted like two minutes. Yeah. Within maybe. a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It was within a few minutes. Some people I know were having trouble. Like they would go to register and would say it was full when it wasn't full. So that's like maybe the most unfortunate thing that happened. Like it, I was like streaming while it went live and people in my chat were like, well, I can't register. I guess it's full. And then it turns out it wasn't full instantly. Um, and you could still register. So some people who maybe could have made it were, un were, un were unable to make it because of some, you know, bug or glitch on the site. Um, but yeah, it went out super, it went by super fast. Um, it was a low capacity, but they did let us know in advance. Um, and like I, I mentioned this in, it was the last episode of the episode before, but they, these things are probably booked quite a bit in advance. And they, I don't think, it was expected the hype for to play get back into these pokemon events especially in a situation where a lot of people just won't have a chance to even get their invite um i don't think they expected these kind of turnouts but um the people are here and they want to play yeah people are definitely excited and want to play but the low capacity led to selling out very very quickly and it's just unfortunate you know there's a lot of people who want to play pokemon but you know we understand that there's certain limitations in place and certain things that you know we don't totally grasp you know we don't we, we are not professional event bookers, right? Like we, we don't schedule yeah. these things. We, we don't know exactly all the logistics that have to go on behind the scenes. So I definitely try to lean towards a little bit more sympathy towards the tournament organizers as well as, you know, the people at Pokemon who are having to make these decisions because they love Pokemon too. They want people to be able to come play, but sometimes you have to make tough decisions and it's just unfortunate that not everyone is going to be able to participate that would normally be able to uh, participate. Something we did want to mention as well is last week we talked about how a lot of this stuff is being announced over on Twitter, how it, there's no official announcements from the official Pokemon Twitter pages. There's no official announcements from the Pokemon website. And I think you had said last week that it's probably almost a good thing that they're not doing that because then it would just add even more attention to it, right? <laughs> because Yeah, and maybe they, they're trying to avoid that. Yeah, because that would just bring so many more play, people trying to register super quickly but it does mean that it's a little harder to find the information. So we had some people on last week's video, on the YouTube video, uh, comment and ask about who they should be following on Twitter if they want to stay up to date with what is going on. So we've got a few people that we recommend following as well, and I both follow all of these accounts. <clears throat> and that's at RK9Labs. That's letter R, letter K, and number 9 Labs. Uh, that is the tournament software that is used, the registration software that is used for all... Um, I think all Pokemon regionals, right, I, I, throughout the world, not just in North America. I'm pretty sure it's all Pokemon regionals. So they have their Twitter page. Yeah. They handle the registration. They handle the deck list submission, all that stuff. So it's a good account to follow outside of that, but they also tweet out all the registration info. Uh, and then also a couple other people that we recommend following at Will Post Tweets. Will is a uh, well-known and well-respected judge in the Pokemon community. And then similarly to that is at C. Shemansky, who's Christopher Shemansky, also very well-known, well-respected judge in the community. Um, so these three accounts are all things that we recommend you guys drop a follow to. And um, they, you know, stay pretty up-to-date and tweet out lots of relevant and important information around Pokemon events. So three great accounts to follow. Definitely check them out if you're trying to register for future Pokemon tournaments. Yeah, definitely go check them out. And I feel like it's hard to get too mad at the organizers or anything mm -hmm. like that. I think there it's fine to maybe have uh, have some concerns, you know, with when next season comes around and if we have the same problems. Um, and it, it, maybe if the capacity, like maybe what if they double the capacity of every regional and they're still hard capping? I think we have to be like, okay, they probably couldn't see that coming. And then, you know, if they're like, all right, maybe next year, you know, it'll be a, a lot more comfortable. But I assume if they like double the capacity of every regional going to next year, those are, they'll be very much comfortable to fit you know every player who wants to play but yeah you know right now i mean it definitely is a unfortunate situation for the players uh, the teals want more people there if they can i'm sure um and i just we'll just have to hope that next season they improve upon it and then if they don't i mean that's when i think it's a uh, definitely a little bit more reasonable to be upset at the uh, at the situation for sure sure and speaking of next season a few new cards got revealed that we're probably going to be playing a lot in the next season there was a you know recent reveal of a bunch of upcoming cards in Japan. We're not going to get these cards in America for several months. This would probably normally be our world set, but I think our world set this year is actually coming out after Worlds, so I don't even think these cards will be here for 
Worlds, the World Championships. Uh, I don't know if that release date has actually been set or not. We will see soon, I would imagine, with Astral Radiance coming out very soon. Uh, but yeah, a lot of really cool new cards, including the Sui and Gudra V-Star, Radiant slash Sparkling Gardevoir. I don't know what the English name of those <laughs> that card rarity is going to be, that new game mechanic that's really similar to the old Gold Star mechanic, which I know a lot of people are excited about. And there are some other cool new trainers and stuff like that. But kind of the big and uh, exciting reveal, the best card, without a doubt, to be revealed this past week was Hisuian Zoark V Star. So we got to give a quick shout out to Tuan Lei over on Twitter, who Azul and I both use for pretty much all translation needs because they are very quick and very accurate with their translations, which is always something that you appreciate. So Hisuian Zoark V V Star. I'll just read the card real quick and we'll give our thoughts on it. For two colorless energy, its attack is. Blaleful Curse, and that's the Japanese attack. It might be called something else in English, but it does 50 damage for each of your Pokemon that has any damage counters on it. So attacks like this could be really strong, especially considering this Pokemon is colorless, but it's all dependent on what ways there are in the format to damage your own Pokemon. And then it also has a very good V-Star power, Phantom Star. You may use this ability... During your turn, discard your hand and draw seven cards. Azul, Zoark V-Star. Is it a, a contender or pretender? Is this card legit? No, I definitely think it is legit. <laughs> I think it'll be probably probably be a tier one deck. Um, but it it's weak to fighting, which is always like a really bad weakness. I feel like to have pretty consistently in the Pokemon trading card game. Zoark survived it pretty well because you could combo with so many other cards and have so many options and it was so powerful by itself that despite having that fighting weakness it wasn't terrible but i feel like we fighting weakness has traditionally been like a pretty rough weakness to have it feels like it's almost like one of those weaknesses that they kind of build the game around to be countered like it's like if you want if we, this is like one of the pokemon that we want to be more easily countered we like that's what fighting pokemon are sometimes built towards is like being good counter decks to things that are weak to fighting so um so it has that weakness of course um but no it's a very strong card definitely seems really good the ability like having an ability like that maybe not quite as strong as star birth but I mean, you can't complain being able to discard your hand, draw seven at any other point. Just a free research on any single turn of the game sounds pretty good to me. Hits really hard. Um, you know, V-Star, decent amount of HP at the 270. So I think it'll be good. Hopefully not broken or too powerful. And uh, hopefully it's just like a solid, solid tier one deck or has its ups and downs throughout the format is what uh, what I would hope, but definitely looks good. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this card is insane, and I also probably lean a little bit more towards the tendency of, oh, new card equals broken, <laughs> which I think is the mentality of most Pokemon players, but uh, I mean, this card just seems absolutely absurd to me. It's colorless, you know, it works with double turbo energy, which is a powerful new energy card that we got in Brilliant Stars, so for just one energy attachment, you can be hitting for e easily one hit KOs on any V-Star Pokemon yeah. easily i say you know kind of in quotations you have to do a little <laughs> bit of work but you know between research drawing seven cards and then the v-star power drawing you seven cards you can hit a lot of the combo pieces one of the big cards for the deck to me is going to be gape jaw bog which is actually i think coming out in astral radiance so we'll get it a set before zoark comes out i'm pretty sure but yeah. uh it's the same pretty much as team magma's secret base for anyone who was playing during that era when that card was really good with drumpa gx uh, whenever a player puts a basic pokemon from their hand onto their bench put two damage counters on that pokemon which obviously combos incredibly well with blaleful curse and then you've also got the gengar that was revealed which you can put it from, uh, once during your turn, you may put this card from your discard pile onto your bench if you do put three damage counters on this Pokemon. And then you can even put damage on the active Zoark because Zoark says all Pokemon you have in play that have damage counters on them. So you can damage your active Zoark with uh, the damage pump item that's gotten revealed as well. Move up to two damage counters from one of your Pokemon to your other Pokemon in any way that you like. And the way this card is worded, it says up to two. So you can bench a Pokemon, put two damage counters on it with Gape Jaw, and then just move one off of that Pokemon to the active, and now you're doing, that's just 100 damage for just one little combo right there, not mentioning any other Pokemon you could possibly bench. So it's kind of a lot to get, but it's not hard to get almost, right? Getting basic Pokemon, yeah. there's so much search, you just got to find one of those four stadiums pretty much, right? Yeah, that'll be like the big initial part. And then we're also getting the uh, the Gengar, 
which is a stage two Pokemon, but uh, you can put it from your discard pile onto your bench directly and then put three damage counters on it. And then that combo is even better with the, the damage pomp because you can move two from a Pokemon, but you can put them anywhere. You can split them up, right? right. Um, so you can take two from Gengar and leave one on it and then two of your other Pokemon each get a damage counter. So there'll be definitely a couple different ways to play the deck. We'll see which one is best. You know, just go with the Gape Jaw, which obviously maybe you play both. Maybe you play like yeah, a couple yeah. pomps, a Gengar, because like a Gengar you can search out with Ultra Ball, right? So you can just get it guaranteed. Um, and it comes out of your discard pile. So you can even discard it. Like I think, I think it's cool with Gengar is like you could discard it early, right? And then because if you go Ultra Ball for a basic Pokemon before you research or use your ability, if you don't have the stadium yet, you put it in play, it's not going to take damage. But you get the Gengar in the discard pile early instead. Then you find your your bog and then the pomps and then the gengar comes out and then everything has damage and you're one at ko and stuff so yeah, it definitely seems good uh the question will be like how good and then how easy will it be to kind of counter or you know tech out your deck to maybe handle it stuff like you know counter stadiums or even probably collapse stadium will be really good against this if there's anything yeah, else avery sure. avery sounds like it'd probably be pretty good for so sure. sounds like there'll definitely be some some answers to it and then it is running almost it seems like it could run solely off special energy which is sometimes a little bit of a trap uh depending on what else is in the meta so you know whimsicott might have some fun with that we'll have to see yeah i mean that is the thing whenever a deck is kind of has a central strategy it usually can become easy to counter and uh yeah. so it's probably a little too early to tell how good this deck will be but it definitely has the makings of it has tier one potential for sure oh, yeah for um, sure. the fact that it's colorless and uh, I mean, and it's kind of weird to me as well that we got Arceus V-Star, which I think whenever, you know, whoever was designing that card obviously knew it was going to be insanely good. And then we get this card, which is also colorless, which is obviously also pretty solid. Um, not too often do we see, you know, super strong colorless Pokemon back-to-back -back sets like this or, you know, within a few sets. It feels like they usually try to break up the variety between all of the different types and give love to multiple different types. But in this instance, they just wanted to make these cards splashable and powerful yeah i mean maybe the person who designed both these cards also designed uh, machamp v max and wants it to have a shot so they made them both weak to fighting and it was like i want, I want this machamp is machamp's to have time yeah. it's just a setup for whoever also designed machamp they're just like setting up the whole format Obviously, also Hisuian Zork being a colors type can play the Dunsparce, which we're seeing in yeah. a lot of Arceus decks right now. So with Fighting Weakness, there is that potential counter, yeah. but there are plenty of counters to Dunsparce as well. You know, I mean, it's got 60 HP, so it gets KO'd pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're putting two damage counters on it. So, I mean, that's just a couple... It's getting you, squishy. You could just zigzagoon that thing, you know, really easily, <laughs> right? Like, like, that could be, genuinely be your strategy. Just, like, play two zigzagoons, you have two nets, boom, Dunsparce is gone. <laughs> Yeah, and then Zapdos one hit KO the Zork, and you're going from there. Oh, I guess Zapdos might rotate actually by the time we'd actually get access to this card. No, no, no. So. Zapdos isn't that old. Zapdos came out in oh, is it not? Uh, Chilling Rain, I think. Yeah, we'll have Zapdos for another year. Okay, okay. So we still got Zapdos, then. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. <clears throat> Plenty of other potential uh, stuff to come out by that time, uh, as well. Um. So yeah, those are the new cards. Moving on, everyone's favorite segment. <laughs> here it is <laughs> guess that flavor text and uh, we've been seeing a lot of your comments on the youtube channel about trying to make it a little bit more uh competitive you know it is a little bit tough to kind of guess out of all well, how many pokemon are there like a thousand like pokemon 800 something yeah or yeah trying to guess something. one out of 800 pokemon when some are so similar with the flavor text so we're not we haven't switched up anything with guess that flavor text yet but we've seen your comments and if you guys have any thoughts on how we should switch this game up uh, go ahead, leave your comments on the uh, on the YouTube on the YouTube video. Um, but I'm picking a flavor text for Chip to guess this week. So Chip, are you ready? I'm ready. This is my time. You're ahead right now. <laughs> one zero. I've said it for a couple weeks. I was so confident with my chat out guess guess the other week. Uh, I've got to get it this time. I've got to get it. I don't think there's any way you're gonna guess this one. Oh gosh. All right. It has strong regenerative regenerative capabilities even if parts of it are bitten off by fish pokemon so there's a good hint there i guess it will return to normal within a few hours even if parts of it are bit off <laughs> Jeez, by that's... fish by fish, by pokemon. fish pokemon okay so i mean yeah, this so obviously pretty... leans me towards like a water type and you know usually a lot of times pokemon are based off of real life animals and you know a lot of amphibians slash reptiles 
uh, can regrow limbs and tails and stuff if they get bitten off by predators in the wild, you know, in real life. So usually that would translate somewhat to the Pokemon world. So I'm thinking of what reptile slash amphibian like Pokemon there are. You know, obviously recently we've had Sobble, Drizzile, and Intellion, but I don't feel like that's super fitting for any of these. Um, huh. Yeah, I'm going to lean towards a water type, some type of like, I'm trying to think what other amphibious-ish Pokemon there would be. I mean, I'm kind of stuck on like thinking of Sobble and Dr like Drizzile, um, but I don't think that's right. I feel like I've read Drizzile's flavored text before, and th it's definitely not this. Um... Azul's giving me nothing. His his face, he's stonewalled over there. No, no hints, no... Oh, man, I'm really stumped here. I'm really stumped. Uh, and so this is where we've talked about, like, you know, maybe get, having, like, the option for someone to ask for a hint and stuff like yeah. that. Like, what generation a Pokemon is from, potentially something like that. What set this specific card they're reading comes from. Azul said he didn't think that would be helpful to him. Um, yeah, knowing the set would not help me at all. <laughs> oh, man. It also could just be – I'm trying to think in the Pokemon games what Pokemon I've seen near water <laughs> and stuff like that. I'm having a hard time with this one, bro. I'm having a hard time. I need to – I feel like I need to guess something. We also probably need a shot clock maybe. But, uh, I mean, the other amphibious-type Pokemon, I think of like Froakie and – Frogadier, Greninja, but I don't feel like that is really fitting for any of them either. I don't feel like this is really any of the starters. I just, I'm genuinely, I don't know, bro. Rizzle's <laughs> dying over there. What's wrong? You good? Yeah, it's just funny. <clears throat> I don't know. This is not right, but I, I'll just, I'll guess, I'll guess Sobble. That's not right, though. Oh, <laughs> it is Gastrodon. <laughs> Gastrodon? <laughs> Gastrodon. The way, I, the way I've always <sighs> I've picked the Pokemon so far is I've just I've just picked uh Pokemon that I think are funny and then I you know I I've think so far. Uh, there uh, when you said regeneration, my first thought was the regenerator ability in the video games, which Gastrodon I think does no it, it doesn't have that. So maybe not. My, but my first thought initially was like Reuniclus, because Reuniclus is a big like uh yeah. It's not a fish. It's not getting. No, I know. And then you started reading the fish, fish part. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that what are some? I don't know. Man, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I don't think I was ever getting that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. So yeah, let us know uh, in the comments on the YouTube video or over on the Twitter, maybe uh, if you're listening on any of the podcasting platforms let us know what are ways you think we could uh, improve the segment because we definitely enjoy it and it seems like a lot of other people enjoy guessing along at home so if there if you have any thoughts on ways that we uh, can make it more fun or more enjoyable more fair whatever it may be let us know uh, so we can make it better yeah definitely and then uh, moving along we got big tournament this weekend UIC. Like I'm I said, sure I'm that's no what a lot of people who are anyone who's traveling right now listening to this podcast is yeah. really hoping <laughs> to get to this part where we're talking about the meta for the European International Championships. Yeah, and um, like I said, I'll no longer be no longer be attending. Um, but yeah, it's happening this weekend. And actually, RK9 just released meta breakdowns. Now they used to do these like after each tournament. I'm sure they're going to get back to doing that. They just released meta breakdowns for the first four regionals that happened. Um, and I mean, there wasn't a ton of surprises that I saw. Mew was the most popular deck for all of them um, by a lot in the first three. It was like 30 percent, over 30 percent, right? For the yeah, first it was like three. around 31, 32, 33 percent for all three Salt Lake City, Brisbane and for uh, Liverpool as well. And Mew was like just by far the most played deck, which I think is what everyone expected. But then there was kind yeah. of an interesting trend shift to Sao Paulo. It was still the most popular deck, but it dropped all the way to 20% of the meta share. A lot more players, you know, leaning into Arceus variants. Arceus variants, I think, overall becoming the most popular deck, but there's just so many ways that people are playing Arceus. Um, and there's just so many other decks out there as well that uh, you know, and people are kind of trending away from you, it feels like, right now in the meta. 
Yeah, and I think that maybe because like more people, because like Muse been a deck for it was a it was the most popular deck last format as well, right? So everyone had the cards for it or had gotten the cards by the time the new set came out. Not everyone had Arceus going into this format initially. So that might be one of the reasons that more people didn't play Arceus decks. Also, the meta developed a little bit more, so people found more ways to beat Mew. Um, and then also maybe just got tired of playing Mew or losing to some of the ways that people had come up with to beat Mew. Um, so I think the meta just developed a little bit more. Mew is obviously the best deck going into the format. It's still, it still probably is the best deck in the format. Um, it was obviously going into the format, it was still the best deck, so everyone was, was going to flock to that a little bit more. But just as time went on, of course, you're going to find other decks that are still good or can compete and contend in the meta overall and specifically up against Mew. So we just kind of see it. Um, I guess it was like it, it held on for it was it was pretty held holy on pretty strong for a while, though. Three weekends in a row, 31 percent or whatever of the meta was Mew. And then it dropped down to like 20. But it just kind of feels like the natural evolution. Maybe four weeks is the the amount of time for the best deck to not be played as much maybe that's that's where we will always see a 10 percent drop off is by that point but that's still a ridiculous amount of i don't even remember the last time we saw a deck that played um like mew and especially like when there's only one way to play the deck right it's not like with zorark and there's zoro rock zoro pods or this and zoro that it's just mew v max right mm -hmm. something i was a little surprised to see looking at all of the meta breakdowns is that you know for the first for brisbane Besides Mew and then the other category, the second most played deck was Gengar VMAX with Houndoom. And then in Salt Lake City, the same thing was true with 64 out of 700 players playing Gengar VMAX Houndoom, second most played deck. And then looking to Liverpool, Gengar VMAX Houndoom was the third most played deck. And it doesn't really feel like Gengar, I mean, it had two top eights in Salt Lake City. But other than that, it hasn't really had the results to back up how popular this deck is, it doesn't feel like to me. And it still was the fourth most popular deck in Sao Paulo. Why do people love this deck so much? I mean, it just has the best Mew matchup, I think. I think it has the... It is, like, actually favorable against Mew, I think. I think Gengar with, like, the four paths of the peak, you have all that in there. I've even started starting to see some lists with more Pico in it, so you have more options of, like, a prize trade route against Mew. Like, I think it just is the... The best deck against me, I think it's literally that has to be. I guess the only reason I think is like there's still enough people out there who are just only solely focused on beating Mew, but you have to beat a lot more right now, I think, to be able to do well or even win one of these tournaments. So you can't focus too solely on Mew, and that's why Gengar, I think, kind of struggles overall, and that's why it's the results aren't there to back up its uh, its play right as much. And I, I mean, it's pretty close, like it was the uh, you said like third most popular, but like you know that top five decks or top the, the the five decks or four decks under Mew are all pretty close in how much of each of them was sure. played uh, for the most part. And yeah, then it fell off a little bit more in Sao Paulo, but it was still up there. But yeah, I think it's just uh, the deck's not that good in the meta. It's just only good against Mew. Right. That makes sense. I mean, and I'm curious how it will shape up here in the European International Championships. Will players trend away from it? You know, is it going to still be in the top three or four most played decks or will it finally kind of dip down below that um or you know because it just against Mew, right you said it has a great new matchup and you really don't need that much like even though your deck is inconsistent all you need is to get two energies on a gengar but yeah. against things like arceus you need a lot you need to get multiple hound dooms in play you need to find all those single strike energies you need to get your switches whenever you've attacked the previous turn you need to find just tool scrapper or tool jammer whichever you're playing at the right times you just need so much more in those arceus matchups and it with arceus becoming more and more popular gengar is not in a great spot i don't think yeah, I think that is going to be the thing. Is like Arcus is going to keep getting more and more and more popular, which um, makes things harder and harder for for Gengar. And I think yeah, I agree. Like Arcus is going to be, I think, going to be. I, don't, I think Mew will still be the most popular deck, probably by a decent amount going into EUIC. I wouldn't be shocked if like Arcus and Talion was the most popular, deck, but I think there's too many different Arcus variants to kind of put enough of them under the the Arcus and Tella umbrella, uh, Arcus and Talion <laughs> umbrella to like have that actually outbeat Mew because the decks are pretty different, you know. You know, there's not going to be enough people playing like the Bruno or something similar to like Bruno's or um, Xander's list from Salt Lake City to like, because I would put both of those as Arceus and Teleon, right? Sure. And those are basically Arceus and Teleon decks, but there's not going to be enough of those decks that I surpass Mew, I don't think. Mew should be the number one deck still, maybe not by as much, um, 
that would be good to that'd be nice to see but it, it will be i think arceus will be a lot more popular though overall so we talked about how in brazil uh the meta share of mew just dropped so much compared to the other regionals and then also decks that ended up having a much bigger part of the meta share were single prize decks, was the Galarian Moltres, Hoopa, Intellian deck, and then also Rapid Strike Malamar had a huge percent of the Brazilian meta as well. And that could have been a reaction to how good Malamar did at Liverpool, right? Because it was the weekend before, so a lot of good players, I think, hopped on that Malamar train. I think only one made day two, if I remember right, or two, something yeah. like that. It, it was not one as was big on of, the wasn't, winning in, but yeah, there wasn't many. Yeah, yeah, one was on the win end, but there was not many. It was not like nearly as big of a percentage as it was in something like Liverpool, but it was still a bitty, a big percent of the meta share. So what do you think leads to these two decks being the, uh, you know, kind of having such a big part of that meta share in Brazil? Does it have to do with the decks being super strong, being good in the meta, or, you know, maybe the cost of the decks? Because these are two of the cheaper decks in the format to build right now, uh, and which I think that definitely plays a factor. You know, we talked about how a lot of players didn't have Arceus's, and so that's why Arceus has steadily started to see more play is because players are finally getting their hands on the cards for it, right? Yeah, I think um, for Malamar, it was definitely a little bit uh, teched against in the... At Sao Paulo, for sure. I mean, you saw Bruno with the Collapse Stadium, which mm -hmm. is good against Malamar. You had, uh, I saw like multiple uh, Avery's, I'm pretty sure, in Arceus decks. I heard about one uh, Duraludon Arceus deck that had Collapse Stadium and Avery in it, like three Avery's and like four Collapse Stadiums oh or something gosh. ridiculous. No bench um, Pokemon for you. So I think, I think people were pretty prepared for Malamar more so than anything. I also think Malamar is maybe um it, it doesn't seem that hard but malamar's a really hard deck to get down and learn initially once you learn it it's not that hard to like you know repeat the process because there's not that much sequencing variance in the malamar deck in terms of just like seeing new hands you're not just going to be like oh my gosh what do i do with after after the cynthia's ambition you know you see you play cynthia's ambition and you kind of play it out the same but to get to the point where you're playing it efficiently there definitely is a pretty big uh uh, pretty big skill gap there that I don't think uh, th that enough people realize. You know, people think, oh, you play Ambition, you either hit the KO or you don't. But there's actually quite a bit go that goes into preparing before the Cynthia's Ambition and then optimal sequencing after the Cynthia's Ambition, not just to get that attack, but to pre prepare yourself for the following attack and so on. So I think that also you know, overall hurts Malamar's win rate. And it's not as powerful as Mew, where you can misplay a bunch and still pull off wins. So once you start misplaying with Malamar, you're going to start to actually dig yourself a hole. Whereas with Mew, you're you're already on like a mound of dirt and you're like digging into it. You never actually break the surface of the the, the, the earth to actually start. You never dig yourself a hole because Mew, you start off on such a big hill. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, that's I think that's definitely why the Malamar. I mean, I, I, I assume that this Galarian Maltrace is dark Intellion. I'm assuming that's with Arceus, right? Like I have to assume. I don't think that's like the Hoopa baby Maltrace Intellion. I think that has to be with Arceus because that was like a pretty popular deck in day two, actually. But there was no like non Arceus Maltrace Hoopa decks in day two of Sao Paulo because I checked the uh, the results. But that's like no surprise because that is like one of the more popular Arceus variants. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like he, that Christopher who made this would have noted on here if this included Arceus almost definitely, right? Because that's like such a huge component of the deck. Like it would have just said like Arceus Dark Intellion or something like that maybe. I don't know. I mean, that's what I would assume, but I also don't see Arceus Dark Intellion on the list either. True. Uh, but actually, I take that back. There was one Dark Intellion in day two. Um, I guess I don't know if there's Arceus in there or not, because on Limitless, it just shows a Moltres and an Intellion. There's no deck list, so I couldn't, I can't quite verify that. But all the other ones, there's Arceus, Moltres, Intellion. Oh, I guess that means there's no Arceus in that one, because all the other ones are, have three little little sprites there, and they have an Arceus, a Moltres, and an Intellion. So I think that, but I, I, that seems like a lot to then have it see it do very poorly and only like one in day two. That's like, uh, that's a pretty big percentage of the meta. And I don't see, like I said, I don't see an Arceus and Teleon dark deck, but I could be wrong on that for sure. So thinking towards EUIC specifically, to me, it really feels like there's two top tier decks, Mu VMAX and Arceus and Teleon. And I think most people that these are the two decks that they've had on their mind as the best decks. These are the decks they're testing the most games against with whatever deck that they're hoping to play to the event. Uh, these are definitely the ones you want to practice with the most. And I don't know if you saw this or not, Azul, but actually uh, Benji Fam, who's a really good player from Norway, a consistent uh, day two competitor from the European region, he actually posted a tweet uh, with a poll on it asking, what is the deck to beat at EUIC? and had two choices, Mew and Arceus Intellion. 
And the results of the poll with 375 votes were 50.4% players said Mew and 496 said Arceus and Tellian of pretty much 50-50 split, as close as you're going to get almost, uh, of players saying that Arceus and Tellian versus Mew are the decks to beat. Which one is, you know, more the deck to beat? Uh, what are your thoughts? Which one is the more important deck to feel like you have a great matchup against going into this weekend? I think it, it's probably Arceus because I feel like everyone's already figured out their Mew matchup. And it's not like there's nothing there's nothing new to test or figure out for the most part until like the next revolutionary Mew list comes out with whatever it might be. I feel like Echoing Horn was kind of that that uh, new inclusion that really shook things up. And it's because now all of a sudden you have to be like, okay, how do I play against Echoing Horn consistently, right? Like, um, and now we're starting to see people cut Echoing Horn, so it's maybe less of an issue, but I feel like most people will still be playing as if their opponent has the Echoing Horn. But um, I think you, you want to be... Arceus is the deck to beat because I feel like you're not you're not going to change anything in your deck that makes your Mew matchup worse, and you're not trying to add anything at this point to make it better. You've probably found where you feel like your deck is fine against Mew. Maybe there's still some things to figure out. People are still trying more stuff to beat Mew, but I would say you'd want to either make your, your Arceus matchup better somehow, find some cards for that, um, or just learn how to play the mirror match better or whatever it is. If you because I assume if you're not playing Mew, you're probably playing an Arceus deck of some kind. I guess it's possible you're not, but um i guess malamar is up there as well but yeah i feel like i feel like it's got to be arceus just kind of for that reason like mew's kind of been i don't want to say solved but more or less so there's way less to worry about because there's so many variants of arceus and stuff like that to worry about like if you take just arceus and teleon then um i mean that's like a way more a way way less explored matchup i'm sure for most people as well yeah that makes sense for sure we talked about Rapid Strike Malamar a little bit. Where do you feel like it stands heading into EUIC? I think it's still obviously very strong, but I do think that there's... It's it's a little tough for it in the meta right now. I think a lot of Arceus decks that are popping up are playing one or two copies of Avery, and even just playing one Avery and dropping it on the right turn can just devastate your board as Malamar. Yeah, it hurts a lot. There seems to be a lot of people teching for the Malamar deck. And then even then, I feel like your Mew matchup is slightly unfavored the more I've played that matchup. I've been trying to like come up with ways to solve it. And I think like you have to play Escape Rope in Malamar right now. Like you need it for, if Mew goes first, you need it for that second turn of yours to actually KO something more consistently. Um, and I think you might even need to go as far as playing two Escape Ropes. And the Escape Ropes are actually pretty good up against Arceus too for the same reason. So they just throw an Arceus V-Star turn two and you're like, nah, I'll Escape Rope. And then you can actually get a KO on that turn. So um but yeah there's people that the, like even there's a collapse stadium in bruno's list like you want to play some out i feel like in your own arceus deck to path to the peak so it may as well just be a collapse stadium then you just make your malamar matchup way better because you can basically end up on a turn where you go collapse stadium and then ko malamar ko NK on the same turn so now they have to play with a triple NK board when they when that's available to you and then they play the collapse stadium and now you have two NKs on your board so what do you discard then you have to discard a sobble or a drizzle or a or an artillery, and then if you have a Sobble in play, if that's what you keep, they can KO the Sobble instead of one of your NKs, and it just gets kind of rough. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of Malamar hate, and I feel like your Mew matchup isn't as good as I used to think it was, but I think there's still some room to figure out how to how to make it better as Rapid Strike Malamar for sure. But I feel like all the Arceus players are playing these random shenanigans. And, that, and the thing is, like stuff like Avery and Collapse Stadium is also good against Mew. So it's not like you just like mm -hmm. it's a dead card in your deck, and it's also just, it just draws three cards even in the mirror match, right? Yeah. So Avery is just um, kind of a decent card. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, draws cards and disrupts your opponent at the same time. And like you know, having a reasonable size bench is good. Like I mean, limiting, making your opponent discard cards can be strong in any matchup for the most part you know unless your opponent's yeah. playing some like deck like arceus duraludon that aims to only have a few pokemon in play like any intellian deck our avery is going to be pretty solid against right yeah and i wouldn't be super scared of if you if like uh if you did want to play malmar i wouldn't be very scared of like if you hit some urshifus that'd be unfortunate but i wouldn't be scared of like other decks like jolteon which i don't think is a great player right now because of the mew matchup i don't know if you feel any different though chip i'm not a huge fan of of the Jolteon right now. Yeah, I don't think I'm a huge fan of Jolteon. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, how Jolteon has a really solid Arceus matchup, and I think that yeah. if you feel like Arceus is going to be the prevalent deck in the room, Arceus variants overall, and that this is maybe the time where Mew is going to have the least showing, I don't know if that's the case, but if you think that, and you are a Jolteon fan, this could be a decent time to play it. 
I'm not sure that Arceus players are going to have Manaphy in their deck or not. I do think some people will opt to have Manaphy. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the Q&A section, because that was actually a question a lot of people were curious about uh, for their Arceus decks. But if you don't think that Arceus's will play Manaphy, and if you don't think that Mew will be the most popular deck in the room, Jolteon could be okay. But if Mew becomes the most popular deck in the room, which I think both of us feel like it definitely still could be and probably will be, yeah, Jolteon becomes a tough play because Jolteon... I mean, sure, you can always win with Marnie plus Path, but that's just such a fragile strategy. And in a best of three fragile strategies like that, uh, most of the time do not come out on top. Yeah, I guess the one thing I will say in kind of Jolteon's defense is I would expect less of the... Uh, better players to play Mew. You know, the top, top level players, I would expect, I wouldn't be surprised if like Tord rolled up with Mew again, again, but like, you know, the the like Isaiah Bradner's, uh, I was gonna say Xander, but Xander's not going, I don't think anymore to EUIC. So, you know, people like even like Pedro, Nico, all of them, like I I, I wouldn't be that surprised if none of them played Mew. Uh, I know like specifically that Robin, uh, like even like Robin probably just will not play Mew at the, at the tournament, right? So you have a lot of these really, really, you know, top level players, uh, world champions and so on who just like are basically saying they're not going to play Mew right and I don't think it's like they're not trying to meta manipulate or anything they just literally don't want to play Mew um, which is fine but that also like leads to being if you're a very good player and you really like Jolteon and you're good with Jolteon your Mew matchup isn't as bad as it actually is right when you're going up against average players playing Mew it's going to be closer to 50 50 or even in your favor as the Jolteon player so in its defense there's that and I guess one other thing against it though is that Urshifu is like popping up randomly in so many decks lately that, you know, you're gonna have to deal with those random Urshifus now being like everywhere on top of Zapdos already kind of being everywhere as well. Yeah, and speaking of that, there's a lot of other Arceus variants running around, you know, the Arceus Sandaconda deck, Arceus Urshifu, Arceus Zapdos, you know, the Arceus Birds, which has the Zapdos in it, which also has yep. Galarian Moltres V, the baby Galarian Moltres, so many other ways to play Arceus. I think we all agree that just straight Arceus and Tellian will probably be the most popular in the room. What are your thoughts on these other versions, though? Where do you kind of put them? Could Arceus Duraludon kind of pop back up and have a bit of the meta? It was actually a pretty decent amount of the meta share, I think, in Sao Paulo, which I was a little surprised to see. Yeah. Um, I think that was almost like a little bit like uh, like premature in Sao Paulo to actually see it be that popular. But a lot of people are talking about it as being like a decent play going into EUIC, which will maybe make it not a decent play because, you know, stuff like Mew players cutting their echoing horns and um and stuff like that is making it a little bit better for duraludon and then even like more of the arceus builds shine away from double sharon's care because i feel like if you're playing arceus and Talion or arceus v barrel and you have double sharon's care you just beat arceus duraludon like it's not even close um but if they only have one sharon's care you play a little bit of healing um or you got like the four boss and you're not even like not hitting their active you're just bossing up their benched uh arceus off the bench like the deck's not bad and it's pretty consistent too so i think there it definitely could pop up I'm not a huge fan of it, and um, I actually I don't think Arceus Birds is a good deck <laughs> for that one. <laughs> I like Arceus and Teleon with like baby Maltrace, and maybe a Maltrace V is okay. Mm -hmm. But like Arceus Birds without Inteleon, I've never been. Uh, I just think that deck is is no good. But um, I could see Arceus. I could see the Duraludon at least uh, having some. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it did well. Another deck that I've you know we haven't really seen much from is Arceus Gengar. Obviously, it won yeah. Salt Lake City. Uh, Drew Kennett played it to the victory there. And on paper, you know, you hit for weakness against Mew VMAX and you one-hit KO Arceus V-Stars. You can beat the two most popular decks. Why has this deck not popped up and been played more ever since Drew won with it? I don't know. From what I've heard is that the deck was not has not been consistent. From anyone I've talked to who's actually play-tested Arceus Gengar, they're just like, it just doesn't function consistently enough. So maybe... Drew running a little bit hot on that day or something like that. Maybe the deck is better than people are giving it, uh, giving it time to actually play with it and learn how to play it well. Yeah. Um, could be one or the other. Could be both. Um, that but, could definitely I mean, no be one... a part of it. I feel like a lot of times people like take the winning list, play like three or four games with it, and then yeah. like, you know, they, they dead draw <laughs> for two or three of those you know four games they play, and they're like, this deck is terrible, and not give it you know the time to really... I mean, there's variance in Pokemon, right? So you're going to, yeah. no matter how consistent your deck is, you're going to draw seven bricks in your opening hand every once in a while. Like, it's just going to happen. It's just how statistics work. Um, 
So, yeah. And I do think that it is a little on the inconsistent side. I think Drew's list literally played like two research, two Marnie as the only draw support <laughs> options. So that's a little I sketchy. Hope for yeah. You're really leaning heavy on the Bibaro there. And that might be where the difference is, right? Maybe Drew always is getting, but like prioritized, get down Badoofs as quickly as possible. Not worried about Gengars right away. Get down Arceus and Badoof and then worry about Gengar. And that's <laughs> yeah. maybe where people are kind of struggling, right? Uh, who knows? Yeah, people don't even know. You're not even supposed to get Arceus turn one. It's supposed to be triple b do and then you go from <laughs> Okay, there. I'm not saying that, but... <laughs> no, but I definitely I definitely feel that. Even playing, like, a ton of Arceus B-Barrel recently, that like, getting Bidoof down is super important. Uh, so I really try and stress getting out Bidoof as, as quickly as possible, even in, like, the Arceus um, B-Barrel deck that I've been playing a ton of recently. The one that you played at your your uh your 1k something's similar to that so like yeah i've been really stressing trying to get down badoof as quickly as possible with that deck because it's, really, it's a really big difference between having access to a b barrel or not um but yeah i mean i don't think there's a ton of huge surprises or a ton of a ton of like sleeper decks right now out of out of any of those for sure um i don't know if you think any different on any other other variants that there might be but yeah i don't think there's a ton of sleeper picks although i wouldn't be surprised if a deck that people haven't really seen or thought of yet comes through and does well something to, similar to something like that like robin played at liverpool yeah i mean i'm a big fan of the arceus uh crobat v max deck the arceus bibero crobat v max uh with just like all the basic techs like pumpkaboo and dunsparce and stuff like that i played that to my 1k this weekend like you mentioned i know you know you were talking about how you've played it a bunch that that's probably the deck uh you know if i was playing it at uic that's probably the deck i would play just because i feel like it's you know got it's it can win against any of the decks it's not like extremely strong against any specific matchup it's like does fine against Mew it does I think it does pretty good against Arceus and Tellian. um but I mean it's just like I feel like it's a deck that can be can beat any of the matchups that it could go up against yeah yeah, definitely. It definitely feels like it has a game plan against everything, but it doesn't really blow anything out of the water if yeah. they draw cards. If they're dead drawing, that's one thing. But and that is one of the strengths of it. I guess it it, it just has felt very consistent. Like um, it feels like a lot easier to get off turn one uh, Trinity Charge plays. Like that can be a huge difference between you know winning games or losing games. I was getting off some pretty big Trinity Charge plays. So even when you're going second, you have that option more mm -hmm. frequently. Um, and then if you go first, you still have you're more consistently getting into that turn two Arceus V Star, which is just so strong. As, uh, as we both know. Um, but one of the things that is uh, really good against Arceus right now that we haven't, like I mentioned, been popping up a little bit is the is the Urshifu. The Rapture like Urshifu, whether it be in Arceus builds or kind of on its own, it's here and it's there. Um, do you think it's going to be... I think... It, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it did well, but do you think it'll be popular? I don't think it'll be popular, but I do think it is poised to do pretty decently. I think that you know Mew is not going to be 30 percent of the room like it has been at these past yeah. tournaments which is the main issue for urshifu's potential success the fact that robin was able to win urshifu when Mew was 30 percent of the room is pretty wild um but obviously you know they have the ability to beat Mew with that list but I, from what i remembered i think you were saying that they said that uh they had a plan but they didn't want to see the matchup right like they didn't want to play against Mew necessarily um yeah, I think so, that's what I saw Stefan tweet when he, uh, mm -hmm. I think, asked Pedro about it. And Pedro's like, I mean, it's not that bad. And of course, when you're when you're that high of a level of a player, unless you're going up against someone like Tord, like Pedro did on the winning end, you're gonna have an advantage. And especially like Tord knew the list, right? So right. that's also a huge edge. Whereas like, like every, every deck, other, right? <laughs> like, yeah, every other Mew player they played up against was probably like, maybe they didn't even see the Mulch race until it was too late, right? So <laughs> it's like you don't know what you're getting into specifically unless you unless you know what's up. So, now yeah, I wouldn't be up. surprised to see an Urshifu in cut, you know, something similar to Robin's list played by a really good player. I do think that, um, you know, in order for the, that list to run deep, it has to be piloted to a super high level. So you can't pick that deck up and go in and expect to do decently. You have to have put in a lot of time with that list because it is got a lot going on. So many one ofs. We talked about it a few weeks ago um on a you know i think two weeks ago on the podcast very good deck but very very difficult to play and then speaking of very difficult to play the last deck we'll talk about before we go to the twitter questions is control sander obviously made top eight in liverpool with this wild control list that you know i'm sure many people who are uh, involved in the community have seen it on twitter at this point and it's on limitless if you want to look it up as well uh to just see kind of this you know energy denial 
control deck where, uh, yeah, you just try to <laughs> win the game by eventually decking your opponent out um, and just making sure that they can't execute their win condition of the game, right? Um, so yeah. what are your your thoughts on control? I mean, I'm sure Sander will play it, right, at UIC. Yeah. So we'll see Sander in top eight. But other than Sander, how do you think control is positioned for this event? I mean, I think it's fine. From what I've played with the deck, the deck is fine. And I feel like that's how Sander views the deck as well. I listened to um, the Lake of Rage podcast that Sander was on, and Sander was like, the deck's good, and that's obviously what I'm going to play. But, like, I mean, my Arceus matchup is not that great. <laughs> like, he was like, it's fine. Like, it's fine. He, it, it sounds like he's not, like, confident like he maybe has been in some of his previous control decks where it's like, if he gets his cards, he's going to win. It's like, if he gets his cards, he's like, if they play well, it's still going to be really, really close if I do, if I am somehow, somehow able to win. So, I mean, I think it's fine. I know Gustavo, uh, who didn't make day two actually at Sao Paulo Regionals, was playing some kind of control deck, um, but hasn't released the list and I think plans to play it at UIC okay. if, uh, if they are going. So I think Gustavo plans to play some kind of control deck. Is it similar to Sanders? Is it something completely different? I don't know. Only the people, only I guess Gustavo and the, the people Gustavo played against at Sao Paulo kind of knows what's going on with that deck. Um, but Gustavo didn't put the list out. So it makes me think it's probably quite a bit different from what Sander had going on. So I'd be super curious to see if Gustavo can do well and actually shows up and plays that some the, the control deck that they've been working on. That would be very interesting. But I think, yeah, definitely probably going to see Sander in the top eight. Will anyone else probably do well with it? Maybe a couple in day two, but I would be I wouldn't be surprised if it's just Sander in top eight and no one else in day two. We'll see how it does. Um, and, you know, you got to respect it. Sander is committed to uh, the craft, right? Committed to yeah. the control archetype. You love to see it. A dedicated control player. Up next, going to go ahead and answer some of the questions you guys gave us on Twitter. Or before we do that, going to go ahead and talk about our top picks. I guess we'll get those out there because I'm sure a, lot, a couple of you would be curious as to what we would play if we were to show up to EUIC and compete. So our top two to three picks. Chip, you go first. What would you pick? Yeah, I think my top pick right now would probably be that Arceus Crobat Bieberel deck that I played to the to the uh, 1k I played in this past weekend I think the deck is just solid you know you've got a win condition against every single matchup and I like playing decks like that most of the time I've spent a decent amount of time working with the deck too so I've played it that's definitely the deck I'm most comfortable with and I think for big events like this um, comfort is really important. Um, you, you need to have gotten the reps in with whatever deck you want to play. And since that's the deck I've played the most, I would definitely lean towards that. Number two would probably just be Mew VMAX. Um, I think I would be playing the Echoing Horn, which is a card a lot of people are cutting, not just because I think Duraludon would pop up, but just because I think Echoing Horn is pretty good against the Ar any Arceus matchup in general. Just yeah. getting that much easier prize without modifiers is super good. So Mew would be my uh, number two there. And then my number three would probably be just like the um, – so, some like uh, Intellian uh, like single prize or deck with like the, the Moltres and the Hoopa and like the Arceus potentially like that Ian Robb, Nick Moffat deck from Salt Lake. Maybe with Arceus, maybe without. I'm actually not 100% sure that you even necessarily need Arceus with that deck. I, I do think that that deck is pretty good still, though. Um, and even though it didn't do the best, I don't think, in Liverpool, it still had, like, decent playability in Liverpool and in Sao Paulo. But um, I don't know that the results necessarily translated. But I do still think that deck is really solid. And I, I enjoy playing it a lot. Yeah, definitely still a good choice. Yeah, I think mine would my top two would be the same as well. And I think my third would be something like Whimsicott, to be honest. Like Ooh. just something to try and get cheesy. Like I think Whimsicott's in a pretty good spot overall. Can lock out a, quite a few Mews out of the game. And that's actually why I've if I was gonna play Mew in EUIC, I would have included a basic psychic, I think. To kind of throw people off in general. Like like if they got some weird game plan around just me playing special energy, now I all of a sudden have a basic psychic and specifically up against Whimsicott, it gives you a win condition against Whimsicott. Where you can go like Elsa Sparkle, basic psychic knockout. If they get the Raihan, you can do it again with a training court. So I think I would have played a basic psychic just because I don't want to get cheesed by by Whimsicott. And maybe two if I thought the Raladon would be super popular. Although I think the Echoing Horn is like makes that matchup extremely favorable. But if I didn't want to play the Echoing Horn for whatever reason, but yeah, I think those would probably be my my top three. So nothing I don't think either of us have I guess both of us like the B barrel Arceus Crobat deck, but neither of us have anything super spicy, I guess, besides that. But to some people, a lot of people actually haven't even heard of that deck. So I guess we have uh we have that to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we're both a fan of that deck and it's pretty good. Um 
So now we'll move on to the Twitter questions and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about some of the things we've mentioned earlier in the podcast um, because people had good questions uh, about a lot of the decks, about a lot of text that they would include, um, you know, rogue decks and stuff like that. So we're going to, and some of the questions are pretty similar. Um, so for example, this first one comes from Bob McDo at Bob McDougal on Twitter asks best texts to play in Arceus and Tellian, Bieberel, Sydney, Dunsparce, Manaphy, Judge. And then also at Alex Wilson asks, is Dunsparce plus Manaphy worth running in any Arceus variant? So of these techs, you know, I mean, we're not playing Arceus and Tellian. We've been playing Arceus Bibrel, but I think we both like Dunsparce. We talked a little bit about Manaphy. If you think Jolteon is going to be relevant um, or if you want to beat Urshifu, I think you need Manaphy. I think Manaphy plus ju uh, Dunsparce just beats the Urshifu matchup for you. Um but you need both of them. If you just have one or the other, then that match, Urshifu is not really winnable. If you don't have Manaphy, Jolteon is a tough matchup, but I don't think either of us feels like Jolteon is the strongest of plays, so maybe you don't need to worry about that. I don't know. What do you think about uh, any of those other techs as well besides the Manaphy and Dunsparce? Yeah, I don't I mean, I don't think the, yeah, I don't think the Manaphy is like even needed to beat Jolteon, but if you want to beat Urshifu, I feel like you need Manaphy. And even then, I feel like they still have a chance, but I feel like you probably end up being slightly favored, at least, if you got the Manaphy in there. Um, the Judge has felt pretty... It just it just doesn't come up. The, them, Rotom, Fomini, a stadium, a stadium on top of their deck when you can respond with Judge, Pat to the Peak, just doesn't come up often enough. Like I think it's probably just not worth playing. I'd rather just play a Marnie, which is so much more consistently better in so many more scenarios so the judge i'm not a fan of sydney i haven't really tried a whole ton with that i've worked out i've tried it a couple times but it's that's another card where i feel like the combo doesn't come up often enough um and now that people know about it they're gonna play around it which makes it that much worse it's just not as good like not playing a more aggressive supporter for your turn just like hitting a mu v max and playing sydney even though you hit the mu v max if you're not like fully disrupting them with that sydney you're not going to be in a great spot on your next turn because usually they're trying to play into some way to get quad fusion strike energy into play. So Sydney is not going to be the answer if they just have a Elsa Sparkle in their hand, right? So I feel like Sydney, there's it's one, it's similar to the judge. I feel like it doesn't happen often enough where I'd really want to include it. Uh, the B barrel though um, is one I haven't tried, but I really like B barrel. So including it in Arceus and Teleon, I think could definitely be good. That one I that one I actually can kind of get behind, and maybe that makes Sydney better, right? Maybe that makes Sydney or even Judge better because you're more likely to see more cards which allow for those cards to actually be played on your turn instead of something like a draw supporter or like a, a boss to just like draw prize cards. But I think pretty much every Arceus deck has to include Dunsparce, right? Yeah, I definitely would play Dunsparce this weekend. Uh, and I think that, I mean, and it could be one of those things where you are trying to be one step ahead of the meta where like all of the Duns all of the Arceus decks are going to be playing Dunsparce. So then it doesn't really make sense to play fighting decks to count things like Zapdos it don't make it doesn't make sense to play them because you don't counter Arceus anymore because they have Dunsparce so because people aren't going to play Zapdos then now you don't need to play Dunsparce right so it's like you could try to metagame the metagame right like be that <laughs> one or two steps ahead but usually being too far ahead of the meta uh just kind of results in you know you're gonna hit Zapdos round one for sure right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's also just like one spot and it's like so much power against so many matchups. And I don't think people are thinking about that way with fighting Pokemon at all. Like, even the fighting Pokemon in the matchup, even if you can't pull off that one at KO, there's still, like, some, uh, you know, some validity to their attacks. Like, even just a Gale Thrust or a G-Max Rapid Flow, whether or not there's a Dunsparce in, in you know, stopping you from getting a one-hit KO, it's still a lot of damage, still doing stuff, right? So And a lot of the, fight, the decks with a fighting attacker have you know, a game plan against Dunsparce, whether yeah, it be like exactly. boss KOing it or Intellion and Zigzagoons to KO it. Like there's options that all of these matchups have in order to deal with that, you know, potential thing. So I think I would still recommend playing it. Yeah, yeah, definitely not not worth metagaming the metagaming. Metagaming the metagame on that one. All right. Uh opt Opti Lulz, did I get that right? At Opti Lulz, how much do you like Whimsicott V Star as a counter meta deck, especially with the amount of special energy, DTE, fusion slash rapid, uh, strike energy, speed energy? Uh, that's around right now. And then Caruso PT asks, is Whimsicott <laughs> expected to top eight? So Whimsicott, is it good? Like I said, it's probably it would be like it would maybe be like my third choice of a of a deck if I was gonna pick a deck, pick my top three for EUIC. I think it's pretty solid. 
Really good Mew matchup right now with pretty much everyone off of double basic Psychic. And then you're just a crushing hammer heads away from slowing down Arceus from even getting off attack on turn two. So what yeah, do you think? I think my problem with the Whimsicott deck, I actually played against one in my 1K this past weekend um, in Swiss. The guy was actually playing a Whimsicott Arceus deck, so it wasn't uh, like all in on you know Whimsicott necessarily. Um, but yeah, it was Whimsicott Arceus and they whiffed the i went first got an energy on my arceus they didn't get an energy disruption card and turn two i went and boss ko'd their arceus with an energy on it with the <laughs> zigzagoon and the choice belt play and they conceded right away the game was over <laughs> like uh and and loaded three ener basic energies onto a benched arceus right so it's like yeah i think that if that's a possibility in any arceus matchup that you could go up against then it makes it tough to play Whimsicott because that can just happen. Like Arceus can just get all the basic energies on and start attacking. I mean, even Arceus and Tellian, if you get the energy disruption turn one, they still have Melanie, right? So they can still yep. get that energy back into play and still get off a turn two Trinity Nova, swinging for 200 damage while you're still sitting there poking for 120. Yeah, I think that's probably the the problem with the deck more than anything is that your Arceus, it could straight into on Arceus builds or even like the Arceus B barrel build like it's just like a little bit too consistent to get it to somehow gain a good matchup besides like path sticking and stopping Starbirth or you know you you go first you attack and they whiff their their Melanie if it's like the water build or whatever to still be able to attack or something like that but if you do get that off like I don't think you're you're pretty consistent I think at getting off like a turn two attack with Whimsicott like I said I like the straightforward builds I don't like the Arceus in there but I think you're pretty consistent at getting a turn two attack so maybe yeah, just yeah. go first or hurt some crushing hammer heads and you can definitely beat Arceus and you have a pretty good Mew matchup so I think there's top eight I wouldn't call I don't I wouldn't predict it to make top eight but t day two I think we'll see at least probably at least one in day two yeah I mean I think that I mean, even thinking back to Giratina EX, which was kind of the predecessor to Whimsicott, Giratina was very strong for a while, but it would still lose games to decks like Night March because those decks were just hyper consistent and yeah. could just knock those de like knock out the Giratina before you ever got off a of Chaos Wheel. So, I mean, I think it's good that those types of attacks, it feels like in the past, while they obviously have that strong lock element and they're great anti-meta answers whenever the meta is really heavy into special energies, it does feel like they are um, just less consistent than the regular decks. And so the regular decks that you're trying to counter can still just beat you some of the time. And whenever you're having a counter deck that's still losing to the thing that you're meant to counter some reasonable percentage of the time, it just makes it tough to to justify playing it in my mind. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Uh, CS0512 asks, what about Lucario V-Star with Arceus in the UIC? And then... Uh, Devanch Copper. Devanch Copper. <laughs> do you think Lucario V-Star will have any sort of impact? Also, which Ar Arceus variant do you think will come out on top? What do you think, Chip? Lucario, you like it or no? Yeah, we talked about it at all. What's that? Have you played with it at all yet? I actually have not played with it yet. I, I well, I, that's not true. I did a video on the 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 theme deck that came out in Japan. Um, so I played with that Japanese version of the deck, but it has like the gritty pickaxe or whatever in it. Um, I mean, Lucario seems strong, right? It does a lot of damage for just two energy. Um, it one hit KOs Arceus V Star, the best card in the format. It feels like so it's got good things going for it, and I really do think we could see it pop up. We talked about this a little bit last week on the podcast. I know you weren't super hype on the card; didn't think it seemed great. Have you played with it at all this past week um, on PCGO? No, I haven't had a chance to yet. But I've seen some lists with it. Like you have like maybe so like the Baby Maltres package in there, and you have the Lucario in there as well. And I, I like the look of those because yeah, Lucario is really strong up against anything that's not Mew, right? Mm -hmm. Mirror match is good, and it's probably good against literally anything else. I mean, V Star um, power so. attack is super strong, and it's going to get you a one hit KO yeah. against most decks at some point, right? Yeah, for sure. So I think it's got some potential. Um, I don't think it'll do well at EUIC. I mean, it'll be one of those decks where, like, hey, like if it makes day two, but I don't consider that doing well. If the deck doesn't like con uh, comfortably get top sixteen or compete for a top eight slot slash make top eight, uh, that's not, in my opinion, there's that's doing well anything besides that anything can do that anything can make top 32 at an ic right like sure no that makes sense i, I mean i'll be interested to see if someone can pop up with it i do think the card is solid so uh and maybe you know once it gets the pickaxe in the next set that'll make it a little bit better 
um, you know, because it has that, you know, yeah. item based to draw and then also potential acceleration with something like a Ranguru. You can make an, a Lucario out of nowhere. Um, so that, you know, gives us there, there's some potential there, I think. So at it's me, Joji TCG asks, in your opinions, what are the best variations of Arceus V Star going into EUIC? And I think we're both really on that Arceus dark deck, the Arceus Bibro yeah. with the Crobat V Max. Yeah, and I think besides that, I might, if I had to pick a second one, uh, I would be the Arceus, Ar like the Bruno slash Xander builds Arceus Consistency and Teleon. Consistency is good. <laughs> yeah, just like straightforward. Just like try and get a turn to attack with Arceus and then have options from there. I thought this was a really good question as well from at Drew Tyler 0509, who asks, what advice would you give to someone traveling internationally for the first time ever? I plan to chase a world's invite next season, and I have never even left the country. So I've actually never I've gone to Canada <laughs> for a Pokemon tournament, but that's basically like I mean, I've been to Toronto, which is like, you know america jr up there or something like that <laughs> i mean it's like not that different right I i've traveled yeah. uh outside of pokemon though uh you know and traveling internationally <laughs> is a lot of fun but you've gone a bunch of places for pokemon so what, what i think you're a better more poised to uh, answer this question uh azul you're gonna offend a lot of canadians with that statement <laughs> <laughs> listen man all i'm saying is like it didn't feel that different from a big american yeah no, That's all I'm no saying. Yeah. all i'm saying <laughs> It's not too. It's not too different for sure. Um, I mean, I don't know. And as far as advice goes, like I'm, I don't really. I'm not really one who thinks about. Like I, I never book any hotels when I travel. Like the people I room, like the people I usually room with, um, are the ones booking the hotel. So, and and I'm pretty lax and carefree about most things. So I mean, make sure you get there before the tournament, and uh, if you want to stay after the tournament, make sure you <laughs> get to the airport what on is time. This like. Advice? That's kind of like I mean that's kind of all I that's like that's how I kind of I just show up. I like to try uh try new food for sure at uh, new places that I travel to. And I recommend yeah. and I recommend not being too obsessed with just Pokemon. So try and find some time to go uh, explore and and uh, enjoy the the travel of it a little bit. Um, yeah. if you're going to be making that that trek out there to you know other places around the world. Um, yeah, get there a day um, earlier than you normally would. Stay there a day yeah. later than you normally would. Something like that. Get a little bit of touristy stuff in. You know, I've heard a lot of people. I think Riley Holbert. I listened to him talking on uh, his podcast actually about you know traveling to these big ICs and how it's just so much fun to uh, you know see different parts of the world and like Pokemon yeah. is a great excuse to be able to do that. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm going to be able to play in this tournament, but uh, you know, take time to. I mean, I know like in Australia, people have gone to like the zoos out there, which is fun. You know, Frankfurt's, you know, an old city. So, you know, maybe you see some historic parts of the city while you're there in EUIC if you're going there. Uh, you know, I think just try to take some time to do stuff outside of Pokemon is definitely good advice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And besides that, I don't really have like there's nothing else. You just got to do it so you can experience it. And it's it's not too complicated. Anyone can kind of get it down. But uh, don't stress and don't worry too much is what I would say about uh, the tournament. <clears throat> Don't right. ruin your travel. At THTCG99 asks, which text to play in slash cut from you for the EUIC meta? So a lot of players have been cutting back on the Echoing Horn. We've talked about that a little bit, how we both still like Horn in Mew right now. Uh, for more than just the Duraludon matchup, you know, just against any Arceus deck, it's pretty solid. Yep. Um, is there anything else that you think is worth playing in Mew right now, Azul? Well, like I said, like right now, I like the idea of the the basic psychic. Yeah, the horn, I want to cut it, but I just like haven't. Like I just like every time I've like thought about like I've, I've played it in like a tournament or two, I think with without it in there. But like every time I think to fully commit it, like actually bring it into a regional without a horn, I'm like, no, I think I'm always going to play the horn. Because literally the first three rounds of <laughs> Salt Lake City, I won because of Echoing Horn. So like, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely good. And it's not just good up against the route on Arceus. You just have to know to you how to use it and look to use it in the other matchups. Uh, but Amarni is another card that I've been testing recently. Um, it allows you to actually have some disruption up yeah, against those I like baby the Maltres. A lot as well, yeah. yeah, the baby Maltres and Teleon decks, you have some kind of hand disruption against that, so they can't just sit there in shady dealings till till the game's over and just have the perfect hand constantly. Um, and then it's also, you know, another out to Path to the Peak. So, I mean, that's that's all the stuff that I've kind of experimented with. There's some other stuff that I want to try, like Leon and stuff, but I haven't gotten around to testing it. And Punkaboo actually is one, though. Um, that I've seen and heard a lot of top players talking about. So 
um punkaboo would definitely be something to consider if you haven't already tried it out definitely something i want to test out myself so that's yeah a, i think that's i heard stefan talking about it yeah. on the omnipoke meta discussion for this tournament i think um where like pumpkaboo is something that you know it seems like is popping up in some u lists here and there it's just an out to bumping that path uh you know all your quick balls and ultra balls now become outs to bumping path which is pretty solid you draw one less card but is it a worthwhile trade-off to be able to just play the game and i think it probably yeah. is right <laughs> Uh, another card that I would maybe think about, and this is just kind of a thought that I've had a little bit, and this is a card that has been played in Mew in the past, and that is Fan of Waves. Uh, you know, people played it initially when Mew came out as like kind of a uh, something in the mirror matches, right? Get people off of their energy attachments with double turbo energy that it's not as good for that reason. But I think what it can do for you against your Arceus matchups is it can break the Sharon's care chain, right? Where they can Sharon's care and prep an energy on the bench and you can just fan of waves, pop that double turbo back into the deck. Then you still are two hit killing the Arceus that's active without letting them Sharon's care and attack the next turn. So that's something I've thought about a little bit. Haven't played it at all. Don't know if it's great. Don't know if it's worthwhile, but I think that could be a decent little tech. And then also, if you just find it turn one against Arceus, uh, if you're not getting off the play to, uh, you know, rope it to the active and KO it with Meloetta, you can just fan it back into the deck and they're not attacking, which is pretty solid too. Yeah, yeah. I actually played a fan of waves in my the Arceus B barrel deck that I've been playing recently, and I caught the caught the mirror match with it once. Where it was just like they went first, they got the capture, and I got the fan of waves. <laughs> um, yeah, it's basically not. It doesn't do anything in the mirror match anymore from you. No, no. Um, but yeah, up against Arceus, it can be a, a little bit of a cheeky play. I guess you could like take them away. You could take them off, maybe getting quad fusion and strike energy on a turn, so you in could the mirror, catch yeah. them. Yeah, they have like one fusion in play on a Mew Max or something. You could send that back and there's no threat of the quad fusion anymore, but it's pretty unlikely for it to come up in the mirror match, I think, anymore. But yeah, up against Arceus, yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty solid for sure. And it could be good um, against something yeah. like Whimsicott, which would, you know, is normally going to be, you know, trying to beat Mew, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Keep him from getting that attack uh, off. So our final question is from an actual fruit. An actual um, how... fruit. <laughs> a real fruit asked us a question. How do you feel about bringing a tech tier two slash three deck to an event versus a tier one? Does the advantage of surprise and the potential for your opponent having a small amount of reps against it outweigh the proven viability of a better deck, especially with the monetary factor of travel? Um, what do you think, Chip? Yeah, first? I was a little confused by the last part of that question because I'm not really sure how the monetary factor of travel affects into what deck you're choosing to play for an event. Um, yeah, if you're the, if you're there to win, oh, I guess maybe like if maybe more expensive, the tier one deck would be more expensive. Is that the maybe so? I guess yeah, that could be the 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 question here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a super important. You know, over the last two years, we've gotten really used to just being able to see our opponent's deck list online, right? Yeah. And with IRL events, you don't have that luxury. You can't make perfect decisions because you don't know what your opponent does and doesn't have in their list. So the factor, the element of surprise is a real thing for sure. And it is a real advantage that you can play uh, to in certain matchups and in certain points of the tournament. Now it does the value of surprise goes down as the tournament goes on because players talk. They're like, Hey, did you see so-and-so is playing this deck that has this spicy card in it? Did you even know what this card did? Like, I feel like that conversation happens once a tournament, at least, right. You know, someone comes up with some card that, you know, yeah. you wouldn't have expected to play. And so people learn about it pretty quickly, but you know, if you can catch people off guard, if people haven't, prepped for whatever tech you have it can be really strong and it can definitely steal some games for you so um you know i think like you know both azul and i you know we like the arceus dark biberel deck um and it's not a tier one deck i would definitely put that more in the tech tier two deck category right uh and not everyone's necessarily going to know what's going on with that deck so um I feel like there is definitely an advantage there because all the tier one decks, while they're strong and powerful, people know what they're doing. They know how to play against them. They know what the game plans are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely say, I wouldn't say there's an advantage. I would say the way I always look at it is I'm always just trying to play what deck I think is just going to be best for me to play on the day. Um, and usually it's going down the path of what is just trying to find, literally trying to find the best deck for the tournament or the format specifically. But you can't always find that. So sometimes you have to settle with something that you just like playing that is good. Um, and that's kind of like what I, what, I'm, what I would have settled with here at EUIC and probably just playing the Arceus B-Barrel deck. Like, I just think it's a good deck and I enjoy playing it. That's, that's why I played Mewtwo at, 
Atlantic City when I won with with uh, Mew Mew Three or whatever the Mew Two tag team deck. I was just like I just like Mew Three, and I, I didn't feel like there was anything better than it. So why not just play the deck that I like playing, right? Um, that's how I feel like with Arceus B Barrel. I don't think there's anything better than it. Probably would just play it, but I don't think there's like a an advantage. I think it's all about just trying to play that deck that you think you're just gonna do best with. Or if you break the format or find some some ridiculous tech to play in a specific deck, then then go with that. You know, just kind of play whatever seems best. But I don't think there's any there's you're not gonna end up with like a higher win percentage thinking one way or the other. It's kind of just a tournament to tournament thing, right? Like we've seen people like Tord, you know, bring ridiculously new decks that no one's ever played before to an IC, uh, but then he also brought the most straightforward ADP Zation deck ever and won the the last regional before <laughs> everything got shut down, right? So there's no correct way to do it. It's all about just picking the the best deck for you for the tournament is going to give you the biggest return consistently. Definitely good points. Well, thank you everyone for sending us any questions. If you have not followed the Uncommon Energy podcast over on Twitter, it is just at under uh, at uncommon underscore energy. Definitely drop a follow over there. We're going to be trying to be a little more interactive with the episode. Ask some questions every once in a while that uh, you know people can vote on and. Uh, also, before these big tournaments, want to take some questions from listeners who are playing in these events that we can hopefully listen. So thank you, everyone, who submitted questions. And I think that's going to bring us to a close for this episode. Thank you all so much for listening, Azul, for, uh, you know, also for, the, you know, joining me with the cast here. It's been a great time. This is our sixth episode. I think it's been a lot of fun. I know I've had a blast with it, and I'm glad we uh, got it off the ground and got it rolling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm super excited to have have done it. It's been something that I've kind of wanted to do for a little while, and uh, now we're cruising, we're in it, and um, I'm going to keep coming at you guys with it. Um, so, yeah, don't forget to check us out everywhere, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok. Um, yeah, it's, been, it's been, uh, been happening over there on the YouTube. Appreciate everyone subbing over there. It's been great. Appreciate all the support. You know, We'll be coming back, you, back at you every Tuesday at 7 a.m. Eastern, and then... Um, yeah, appreciate you all listening. See you next week. Chip. Peace. Thanks, guys, for listening. Good luck to everyone playing in the UIC. We'll talk to you guys next week.